thank you, Brother Richard, and thank you, brothers and sisters of Philadelphia. And it indeed is an honor to be asked to come and speak to the Marcus Garvey African Lecture Series for the UNIA with a very long and illustrious history. And I'll try to do my best to be clear in speaking on these, these points related to the issues of melanin as it relates to black dot. What is black dot? What is melanin? I'm certain many of you have already had some exposure to these very old concepts. The name melanin is not the comedic name. It is probably more of a Greek name or thereabouts. And it was used in referring to a person, a, uh, a certain mythological story that probably has African roots. The mythological story is one in which supposedly Europa, who was a goddess of types, and she and her girlfriends were walking along the seashore, and the god Zeus, who we now know, was just the Europeanized version of a much older god type that was African in nature. But supposedly Zeus saw Europa and then became uh, interested in her and then changed himself into a white bull. And then Europa got on the back of the white bull and the bull rolled across the ocean to the island of Crete. Well, that certainly is a Europeanized version. I don't know what the African roots of, of it are. But in this concept, one of the children of this union was that of melon, a melano, and it referred to black. Another reference refers to melon as referring to the blackness that occurs in the sky when the sun sets in the west. Now, both of these versions are found in the book uh, Black Athena by Mord Banal, the second volume. There's another reference to melon, which refers to another mythological story in which Melanos was a man who overheard some snakelets. The mother of a snake family was killed, and the snakelets were left without anyone, and he befriended the snakes and fed them, and as a sign of return, they taught him how to communicate telepathically with the animal kingdom. So what is a common thread in all this? One, it certainly has to do with blackness. Two, it has to do with extraordinary powers. From whose point of view are these powers extraordinary? Why aren't they ordinary powers? And if they are ordinary powers, what kind of game is being played to make them seem to be extraordinary? In the book uh, that has just been recently released by John Henry Clark, Africa at the Crossroads, World Revolution. He makes known a very important point that was earlier made by Adam Van Sertima, that in this year, 1992, suppose somebody is going to celebrate, come October, the 500-year anniversary of somebody named Cristopo Colombo, who is said to have discovered people who greeted him in a more humanized state on the seashore, and within a matter of two, three years, he had killed them off by the millions. And so John Henry Clark calls this the, and Van Sermon called this the 500-year room. The great lie, the great game of cover-up to hide a whole nother world view, a whole, a whole history, if you will, biological history and written history, of all of humanity to present a great lie that models the world in the image of a child and hides the biological realities of the parent. So this is, this is critical. So this five, I'm saying that as we enter into the discussions of melanin, there has been a reversal and a lie going on that tries to cover up the biological records of what the 
the man who has hue or human, people of color, what your true biological potentials are. And there's a great cover-up, a great lie, just as there was, is in the written history. So here we go. Now there are three documents that are available for you today, and I'm going to draw upon them as we kind of march through some things. One is the book, The African Origin of Biological Psychiatry. And this is a book that I have worked on for at least, oh goodness, all of my adult life. <laughs> And then it was published in the Journal Urias, which is a publication of the Aquarian Spiritual Center in Los Angeles from the years 1982 through 19, 1978 through 1982. These are the articles that I contributed. And the others are articles published thereafter. And in this uh, came the, the uh, series of articles called named Urias, parts one through four, and Black Dot, parts one through three. Earlier work had been done on the esoteric theory of press theory, and earlier work, had, and then more recent work was published that was never published any place else, and that was on the Eye of Horus as it is defined in the pyramid text, and the Eye of Horus as it is defined in the coffin text. The pyramid text, or the text of ancient Egypt, dating from the time of the Old Kingdom, 3000 B.C. to about 2200 B.C or roughly almost 5,000 years ago. The coffin text, or the Middle Kingdom text, roughly about 2200 to about, about 1800 or so BC. That's the middle period. So these are the religious texts in which we find that Africans had talked about melanin under the heading of the word Kim, K-M. What does Kim mean? It means black. And as Carol Bourne in his book did make known, that the study of chemistry, history, study of chem black, is really the study of blackness. In particular, the study of organic chemistry. The study of those chemicals that contain large amounts of the atom known as carbon, C-A-R-B-O-N. Carbon, the same atom that makes up diamond earrings, diamond rings, crystalline form, but in its more liquid form, it is blackness. The graphite on your pencil? What about the blackness on your skin? The black in your coloring of your eyes? The black in your brain, yes. Melanin in the core of the brain. So that in, these, in this book, we reviewed, especially in Black Dots Part 1, 2, and 3, the biological record of blackness as it operates in biological systems from before birth, from conception, all the way through the, the genesis, gestation in the mother's womb and the birth thereafter. We could show blackness in every life stage. But yet, the great lie continues that blackness is a sign of being inferior. Blackness, or melanin, the chemical that is responsible for black pigmentation, is a sign of being second-rate, of being dirty, of being more like an animal, of being not as advanced as those people who have golden hair and light skin. And that is the biggest lie that was ever put out. It is a lie that goes against life itself. I could take right now today any member of the most racist organization, the most virulent racist possible, and I could dissect them this minute and show huge amounts of melanin in the core of their brain, in the lining of their eye, in the uh, neurons, um, uh, cell junctions in their inner ear, in their skin in places, in their heart, lungs, kidneys, any organ in their body, and I can say 
Now tell me what you're saying about blackness. You want to call from them being an inferiority, you could not even be conceived without melanin. No way. So again, those are in Black Dots Part 1, 2, and 3. Let's go through some examples, and I'll kind of work it on through. The examples of it is that there's melanin present in your mother's egg and the father's spermatozoa. And when these two cells meet, the egg is fertilized by the spermatozoa, and the DNA from both cells join together. Where is our dear friend melanin? It is present in the outer layer of this fertilized egg. So the outer layer of the fertilized egg, or a zygote, or what you'd call a blastula stage, later a gastula stage, or the ectoderm, is black. It contains black pigment. And this is true of not only blacks, Asians, and browns, it's true of mammals, hard primates, advanced mammals, lower mammals, amphibians, reptiles, birds, fish, any animal that has a backbone has the same pattern. And why is that the case? Because melanin is God's felt point pen. What do we mean by that? That melanin is a neurotoxic agent. What is neurotoxic? Toxic to develop lines of growth, neuro neuron. Melanin sets up electromagnetic gradients or lines of force by which as the cells develop, they migrate along these lines, and just, as, just as you might have a blueprint, and station themselves along the lines of, of these electrical mag magnetic fields. So melanin is the blueprint to draw in any living animal that has a backbone. Going further, this outer layer of cells invaginates and becomes a tube. And the end of that tube balloons out and becomes, guess what? Brain. The tube is the spinal column. The ball at the other end becomes the brain. All this are occurring from melanated ectoderm from a fertilized ovum by, by a spermatozoa. The end of the tube, which balloons out, is known as the neural Blackness is a sign of something that doesn't even matter as much as whiteness. But yet I'm saying to you that if you go to these biological records in any medical school library, science magazine, New England Journal of Medicine, any other standard medical journals, you will find tons of references showing the black basis of organization of the entire, lot, entire body. So those are absolutely critical points to consider. Furthermore, going a little bit furthermore with it, there have been pigment cell conferences held every two to four years, starting in the late 1940s, in which scientists from around the world, in particular South Africa, they had a ready supply of black bodies to do their horrible previous work. And, that, and probably that's not unique to South Africa probably we can look at what happened to jail systems here in, in these states, and it's no different. But we notice that the research does not fit the political agenda. So when you go through these research journals, you have to be aware that people are writing 
in ways that they were trying to pull the information out, but then you as a black person have a responsibility to make it applicable to your people. They will not, for example, tell you that yes, there are hormonal differences in black blood compared to white. They will not tell you that black folks tend to have lower white blood cell counts because of the difference in the level of the secretion of adrenal steroids. That will not be mentioned. They will not talk about the differences that occur in terms of other hormones. That will not be discussed in, in, in elaborate detail at all. But going further, we find that these various glands that are pictured in the pineal, I mean, pictured in the entire human body and their black origins, they, they, they have formed a system called the eight-foot cell series, standing for those cells that had the same properties that they all originated from the same original site. These cells are called the amine precursor uptake decarboxylate. What does all that mean? That all these cell types had the same common feature. They all have an a enzyme that can break off carbon atoms. What is a carbon atom? The atom that makes up melanin. So at least they had the ability to shape and mold the melanin molecule and those molecules are chemical children of melanin. So that's a very, very important feature. But notice, again, Africans talk very heavily about kin. They spoke about what? When you speak about uh, going into the, the study of, of uh, melanin, and in particular, you pay attention to the study of the pineal gland. What is the pineal gland? The pineal gland is a gland present in all humans. And again, most animals with the backbone. This is a gland that's present right in the center of the head. It is known as the third eye. It is a gland that's referred to in the East Indian literature as the third eye. But Africans called it what? They called it the eye of Horus. And what was being meant by the eye of Horus? It was said that Horus, who was the son of Osiris and Isis, got into a battle one day. You see, his father had been offended, had been violated, had been killed, cut into pieces by his, his father Osiris, had been done all these bad deeds by this evil brother named Set, Set Typhon. And so when Horus came into contact with Set later on, of course, Horus had some dues that he wanted to charge Set, and Set didn't want to pay. So they got into a battle, the great battle at all. And as they fought, it was said that Set hit Horus in the eye and shattered the eye of Horus. But Horus struck a mean blow. Horus snatched off the testicles of Set, and that was it. But that would usually be the end of the, end of the fight. <laughs> these, are, these are, again, are symbolic stories, but also literal stories. And we'll have to look at some of the literalism of them in just a minute. It is speaking further that the god Jehudi, or Thoth, the moon god Jehudi, the god of wisdom, the, the so-called, the, the, the perfect example of intellect, the, the so-called the heart of sun god Ra, the super genius. This was the example of the, of the Moki genius even before the time of Imhotep. Came to, brought the eye of Horus, the sound eye of Horus, back from across the river and put in a regenerated new eye in Horus. And even gave poor Set his stuff back to keep these cosmic forces in balance so they could, could continue their drama. So we have a notion that Horus has a new eye after battling evil. So it raises a question that they are saying in some respects that just as on a cosmic plane that the forces of light and darkness are in constant struggle, constant interaction, so too on a human plane are humans people with hue, involved in a struggle with their own Sethian nature. 
to hold on to it. And then in this struggle, many times their vision gets blurry and they have to develop a new eye, a new way of seeing based upon their ability to contain and to stop the reproduction of their own internal evil. You hear what I'm saying? Very delicate point. Now I submit to you, fellow Africans, that Africans had studied the science of the mind so strong and so sweet that they had not only discovered the location of the soul, but the neurochemistry of the soul and its relationship to blackness. So now we get way beyond Sigmund Freud, way beyond Court Nelly, way beyond Russell Ritter. Now we're coming on back home to a study of the African true science of neuropharmacology without all this fanfare and cover-up. So going further, we find these kind of things. We find that the pineal gland, again, was the name of the eye of Peru. We find that in the pyramid text and coffin text, over a hundred references to the eye of Peru. It says that the eye of Peru is present in the forehead and it rises up as thy, thy father Ra the sun passes overhead. Meaning what? Something in the forehead is turned on by the sun. That was 3,333 years before Axelrod and Wortman rediscovered the pineal gland was an active gland producing a unique enzyme called H-I-O-N-T. But notice further, it said that at the pineal, that there were, there were blue eyes, green eyes, and red eyes, and black eyes, eyes of Peru. And that it was possible to rise, and that the mission was to rise up with your eye of Peru to the heavens and to become a star. Not a Hollywood star on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> That's not the story they're talking about. But a star in terms of the cosmos. They envision these kind of, kind of very strong powers. We find furthermore that the pineal gland is a gland that produces two major hormones. One during daylight, another one during nighttime. During daytime, a hormone known as serotonin is released. Serotonin has many important powers. One of its powers is, a, is, is also involved, there are many uh, very important neurotransmitters that are related to serotonin that are involved in states of depression and normal affect. But the hormone that we're gonna talk about today is the hormone known as melatonin, M-E-L-A-T-O-N-I-N. Melatonin. Now this, my brothers and sisters, is a powerful, powerful black hormone. This one is so strong that you have to just sit back and just sing on it. <laughs> Melatonin. It is released as soon as the sun goes down. It rises and reaches its peak around midnight, from midnight to 1 a.m and then begins to taper off, and it tapers off and stops right before sunrise. Now notice this, that during the dark hours, a hormone is released by a gland in the brain, and this gland in the brain, this hormone is so powerful, it affects the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and many other organs throughout the body. So here we have one kind of hormone being released during daytime, I mean during nighttime. What is the hormone that is released during the daytime that operates in concert with melatonin? I don't believe it's so much serotonin. I believe it is the hormone known as vitamin D. I have to give you all these names so we can play one in just a minute. It will, it won't be, just take, just bear with me for a little while longer. Vitamin D. How is vitamin D made? Where is vitamin D? What does it do? 
Now we've spoken about the pineal gland. Again, the pineal glands in, in the brain form the posterior floor uh, of the third ventricle, whereas the anterior or front part is where the pituitary is. You know, the pituitary produces the hormones that are involved in the control of your sexual cycles, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, LH, the luteinizing hormone. The hormones that are involved in the growth hormone that determine your bone growth and your control of, uh, uh, of, of metabolism. You're at five uh, hormone, thyroid releasing hormone, TRF, and TSH, all these hypothalamus pituitary complex, prolactin, uh, very, very other important, vasopressin, a number of different hormones. But again, being very heavily controlled by the pineal melatonin. But in the skin, we have the melanocytes that are present in skin. They have been present from the time of during the growth of the fetus. Again, remember the mural crest, where the, when that tube formed and then the end of the tube ballooned out, and the tip of that tube is called the neural crest, and from that place, the neural crest, these cell types then moved out, and they moved all over the body, and they positioned themselves right where the dermal, the dermis, or deep layer of skin, met the upper layer of skin called the epidermis. So right at that junction is where we find the position of the melanocytes. Melanocytes do some very powerful things. They secrete the hormone known as melanin, melanin, not melatonin, but melanin, into skin cells as the skin cells grow up from their bed. And it, it injects the melanin into the skin cells that passes by this junctional layer and moves upward. Just like a, it's almost, it looks like a hypodermic needle being put right inside the cell and giving it shot of melanin. The melanin, as it goes into the cell, then organizes itself as a uniform or a block sheet over the nucleus of the cell to protect the cell from ultraviolet radiation. Now, why is that important? It's important because the intense rays of the sun, when it hits the nucleus of the cell, may knock out certain codes in that DNA and call for misreading of the code and the cell will then become will die or become cancerous and i'm from the i've spent most of my time out on the west coast and they had this thing called the beach boys and the surfer bunnies and all this where all all those folks who spent white folks without much melanin in their skin without any protection by the age 28 27 the skin was shot it had looked like it had been, it was the skin of a person who was 50 years old. Had loss in its elasticity, full of holes, big pores. Didn't even have normal perspiration you and I ordinarily have. And many of them have long since passed on with skin cancer, or had various skin lesions. So that's the result of not having your right kind of shield. But again, what does melanin do in another kind of way? The melanin present in that layer of skin provides a very important role, which plays a critical part of the history of the unfoldment of the human family and the unraveling to the degree of the human family. In the deeper layer of skin, where the blood vessels are, the hormone known as vitamin D passes through in blood passes in blood. It is formed in, a, in an act, inactive state called vitamin D1 and D2. As sunlight penetrates the skin, it actually energizes the hormone and makes it into an active form called vitamin D3, D4. The, the active form of vitamin D, as it passes through your intestinal tract, is what pulls calcium out of food into your body. Without the active form of vitamin D, you could eat all the calcium that you would want and it would run right through and you would have very little calcium being retained in your body. People who lack vitamin D develop a condition known as rickets. Bow bones, bow legs, notchy ribs, soft bones, Women in their later years who have problems with vitamin D metabolism also develop osteoporosis. Soft bones, stooped over, 
How many of you seen black women stoop over like this in their 50s, 50s or their 60s? Not a regular occurrence. What about others? Oh, rather common. So what we're saying is that vitamin D in the inner layer, deep layer of skin, as it is being energized by sunlight, is a critical thing to consider. But notice, we all know by this point in time that all people of the human family came from Africa. And people who came from this parent stock indeed had black skin. There's no way that you're going to be able to survive in Africa near the equator with intense ultraviolet light and sunlight and not have dark skin. Without dark skin, you will fry. Your skin cells will become cancerous and you will not survive. But as our people with skin color move to other parts of the planet, i.e. Europe, Europe, and especially past the 54 degree latitude, it was okay for a while until the periodic ice ages come on. When the ice ages came on, those people who had dark skin color had a problem. Because dark skin in a condition in which you don't have much sunlight and a very low angle of sunlight in the sky and large amounts of cloud cover is dangerous. You will tend to develop a condition known as rickets, in which the sunlight, you're not receiving much sunlight, you're wearing animal forest furs to stay warm. The sunlight is of a very weak strength. It cannot penetrate the, the dark skin color, upper layer of skin enough to energize vitamin D. And therefore, those people develop very little vitamin, active forms of vitamin D and develop rickets. What does that mean? When we look at the skeletons of people in the beginning of the Ice Age, what do we see? Black people with rickets. We see the skeleton, we see the ricket bone type. And we look at it further on to the Ice Age, the rickets is no longer there, meaning what? That their skin color became progressively lighter and they could make vitamin D. But what was the problem? Did you develop vitamin D and you lost your skin color? and you survive, but what was the penalty? At what price? And here is a very, very critical point. You develop that at the risk of developing too much calcium in your body and you lost your spiritual vision. What do you mean by that, Dr. King? That calcium, present in large amounts, began to calcify the pineal gland. So we find that European populations, European African populations, that the pineal is calcified in the majority of the adult population. And it's 80, 60, 80 percent and above in European populations in Boston, San Francisco, Stockholm, Sweden, calcified pineals. In black populations, 5 to 15 percent. And the darker the population, the lower even the lower the incidence. In, Niger in uh, Nigeria, five percent. Cincinnati, ten percent. Watts, California, fifteen percent. In a calcified pineal, the pineal reaches only one half as much hormone as a non-calcified pineal. That means. So in other words, we're saying that people who survived in Ice Age Europe did survive. They lost rickets. They couldn't make vitamin D because they had light skin. And they couldn't make enough vitamin D in those, in, in those ice age conditions. But they had a reduced level of spiritual vision. They had that then, and it's shown up after now. Shown up after now. That's very clear. So we have, now we have a, a crossroad in which history and biology and chemistry are saying the same thing. Despite the big lie. Despite the big lie. Dr. King, in science, there is no such thing as bias. Says who? Who's science? Printed whose textbook? Funded by whose funding source? No. Science is through the mind of a man and a woman. 
And they have, if they've got a bias, they will express their bias. Bias has a very, very uh, enchained legacy, if you will, in covering up and not being true to its traditions. It's, it's, science is not a god. It's just people writing their versions of science. And the same ratio that you experience in the historical text, it is certainly rampant in the biological and chemical text. And certainly in when you speak about these points. So coming back to the, 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 the central point, that when Czech Antidiop in his book Civilization of Barbarism speaks about the development of the Cro-Magnon type as being the emergence of the ca Caucasian community from their black hot and top parents, which he does say. And he identifies the location at which this took place in Bas, Spain. And, says that, and it took place between 20 and 25,000 years, years ago. That's right in Sheikh Antliop, Civilization, Civilization of Barbarism. And he said that as the glaciers began to recede, that the Cro-Magnon Caucasoids went north with the glacier. They liked the ice. They had become conditioned to it. They moved north into Scandinavia, and then they went east into Russia, and further east into some parts virgin on, uh, further in, in, in near Asia. And then they turned south and invaded Greece. Hear what I'm saying? Invaded Greece and invaded India. And then came back around through what is called the, the Middle East, so-called Lebanon and Israel, and invaded Canada. But notice what was said in the ninth dynasty by Egyptian pharaoh in Margaret Lightman's uh, book, uh, Ancient Egyptian Literature, it says this, that this pharaoh in the ninth dynasty, during a time of turmoil, says, oh, lo, there go the lowly Asiatic. They come from the mountaintops. They have, they have their hands outstretched, they are hungry, and they have been fighting since the time of Horus, meaning that these people come from mountain regions, they have a paranoid mentality, they have a greedy mentality, they're, they're starved, literally, and they're always fighting. He, they call them Asiatic, not because they originated in Asia, but because that's where we saw them first appear, when they came out of Asia, but they had started off farther back than that in the western regions of Eurasia, in the area near the junction of France and Spain. So that's a little bit of the background. So we have another line. We have history, biology, and chemistry all crisscrossing the same thing. That somebody with a different kind of consciousness, with a different eye for root, came in to our home, and he was paranoid, he was violent, and he was hungry. And he's been that way for a long, long time. So that was said before 2000 BC. And we knew his condition. Now, furthermore, it raised a question that when we look into another book by, that is called Fall, the Hermes of Egypt by Bolin, now I'm going to stop being the lecturer and now I'm going to be the school teacher. We're both dead. Um, Thoth, the Hermes of Egypt by Bolin, it is said that Set used to not be a negative god. It was a god of the south. But following the invasion of the Hiskos, that the attributes of Set, which used to be positive, were then transferred to Jehudi or Thoth and Set became labeled as the devil. And anybody with red skin was considered Set light. Now, I'm going to stay on that. Somebody with very fair skin came through the desert, got sunburned, and they were paranoid, they were violent, and they were hungry. So we said, oh, yeah, those red skin, sunburned skin, 
means you have this kind of condition. You're, you're, dev you're devilish. So we began to equate, we began to look at a cosmic issue of the balancing of dark light and dark not, which, which weren't originally considered good and evil. That was just the forces of nature. And we began to see the expression of a person who lacked moral strength, if you will, who couldn't keep their Sethian condition in focus. Their Sethian condition was, was wild and wicked. It was running the show. And it wasn't being balanced by my eye. It didn't, if anything, it was in a celebration of Sethian ideals that they were involved in. Some people, some people love blood. Some people love violence, despite what they might say, some people get off with, with what we call a sadistic nature. Jeffrey Dahmer loved it. I'm temporary in North Carolina, and a guy down there ate up his best friend and his girlfriend. He came in on him. He was, he had people's genitalia inside of a, inside of a jar. That's not new news. There are many people who are necrophiliacs. There are many people who are cannibals. And again, the game of history is to do what? Is to take my impulses and my desires and to say that they're yours. Project them onto you. Make you appear to be what my own desires are. So that's, that's a game. That's a hustle. But back to it, this person named Bolin makes a point of saying that these, the attributes of Seth were transferred to Jehudi, and then Seth became identified with not a cosmic condition, but to a human struggle between populations. A invader type called the Hiskos, the so-called invading mulattoes, say it like this, people who had, who, who, who had, who had many times been forced because the invading people had taken advantage of the family, killed off the daddy, raped the mother, and took the children of the mother as slaves and made them into their brainwashed slaves. But the children are still trying to put <coughs> to gain daddy's acceptance and daddy don't even care about them. He's just going to play on them and, and turn them out too. That game we see played time and time again. Um, so that with this group invaded in, and then they are forced out in a, in a war of liberation, some say 75 years, some say 350, some say 500 years, in which when the brothers came from the 17th dynasty being led by a very famous sister named Teddy Cherie. Teddy Cherie is, a, is an elegant lady. She was the, of course, she was the mother of Nef Nefertari. But Teddy Cherie's husband, they rose up and their children able to uh, to start the wars of liberation. And those brothers got so strong, the 18th dynasty, the sisters got so strong, they chased those people all the way back to their home base, all the way back to northern Eurasia, and locked them up for a thousand years minimum. Strong battle. But no, long, long story made short, please hear that the eye of Peru is the statement of what Africans really are about. They said that, that, that there was a regenerated eye that, that could come on when a person had fought with their evil. So they had two different conditions. They had the, I, I give an example, the educational system that you already heard about. How many of you read George James' Stolen Legacy? I see a show of hands. Oh, most in this room. And so you've read in chapter three that in the education that there were three grades of students. These the grade of neophyte, the grade of intelligence, and the grade of sons of light. And you've read that in a neophyte stage that you study the laws of nature and you practice the ten virtues. In other words, you study physical science and you also con contain or develop your own inner science by practice of the virtues. And, if, and as one did that, then one developed a condition called inner vision. Inner vision, my sisters and brothers, is an activated pineal gland. Do you hear that? That when you had developed inner vision, you had developed the sound eye.
Jehudi, the God of magic, science, and writing, then had given you a vast expansion of intellect. So it's said that Africans knew, in other words, at that point in time, you were able to be consciously aware and to move through your ka, the K-A. You could protect your mind and project it in time and space. Be telepathic. <coughs> you could really tap your genius mind. In other words, you knew that, that the mind had a supercomputer potential. It could pull memories from any ancestral memory that anyone who made up your bloodline ever had. Be it a grandfather, great, 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 great grandfather, mother, or whatever. And you could also pull ideas from the future. That when you reach this level, that you can then truly be a living God while on earth, even in the fleshly body. So can you understand, with that kind of knowledge, why it is critical that the oppressor has to cover up what our potential really is. Your pineal gland is not likely to be calcified. But his is. Your potential is the same as his, but also far greater. Now, I do not know what they can do to decalcify their pineals, because that's it depended upon a person who wanted to decalcify their pineal. And I submit to you, that some people love being like set in a negative fashion. But it's very, very important to consider what other issues that do come up. Let us just read, for example, what some of these statements are, coming from what we said about ourselves. Oh, take the eye of Horus. Present, prevent him, him meaning set, from consuming it. O N, take the eye of Horus, the garment of which the gods are afraid of. O N, Horus has attached his eye to your forehead for you, in his name, great of magic. O N, take that of which the gods are afraid, if they are afraid of Horus. Take the eye of Horus against which Seth acted. In other words, this was, you have to really struggle with it and that the struggle involves a study of science and living a virtuous life. Now the virtues is a long, it's a list of 10 virtues and stolen legacy. You can also read about the 42 negative confessions that are cited in the, the Book of Coming Forth by Day, also cited by Budge, also very heavily cited by our own illustrious Dr. Yusef Ben Jarkana. But these are ethical ways, moral ways, of relating to your family members in a way that will help you both to prosper. And also, it will help you to stay on the good side of the ancestral world. Because truly, to do things that run against your family line will mean that the ancestors who do live in us will cut us off from inner knowledge. Now, in this same notion, let us consider some other aspects. We've already covered that the, that the melanin is a biologically active chemical present in skin cells that, that is also present in other organs in the body, brain, lung, liver. That the pineal gland is a gland present in the brain that produces a hormone known as, known as melatonin during, day, during darkness. And the hormone melatonin affects the production of melanin in skin through the pituitary, MSA, melanocytin hormone, and it also very profoundly affects all the major glands in the body. We've also considered how the melanin, as it's exposed to light, determines the formation of vitamin D and how vitamin D controls calcium being pulled back into the body. We didn't say this, but I can say it now, that vitamin D is a powerful hormone that acts in concert with melatonin. So just as melatonin acts upon the body to produce one kind of, you get tranquilizing effect, that the, uh, the vitamin D is an activating hormone, so it, it is, so it is the signal inside of the body of being exposed to sunlight. So it is what is called a somatotropic hormone. It makes things grow. Now, all this being said is to come to the key point and the key point 
is that melanin is a doorway, a doorway by which energies can move from the physical material level up to the spiritual level. It's a divine molecule. It's a life molecule. And in those things that were first, imagine this, in the very beginnings of life on this planet, four and a half billion years ago, that those life living chemicals could, could, could actually could take sunlight, hold on to sunlight, and convert into a chemical that can be used as food so that an animal could reproduce itself, or the plant reproduce itself. So that's, that's a critical point. Melanin is present in the eye, for example. The inner lining of the eye, you can even see black, white, or color only because you have melanin in your eye. In the layer of the eye called the pigment layer of the retina, it is a layer that, that as the rods and cones shed their rods, their, 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 their disc, a photopigment, and the, and the disc again have captured photons, particles of light entering the eye. And as it hits upon that, that layer, the melanin plucks the photon of light out of the carrier molecule that for, for color vision or black and white vision and converts it into an electrical charge. That's true of all eyes, be it black, white, green, or whatever. There's melanin present in the inner ear that when you hear sound waves, the inner ear nucleus that has pigment, it converts a mechanical wave into an electrical wave, an electrical thing. So notice sound, vision, all these things very heavily involved in melanin. Well, let's, let's take a little bit of a different track. You're being very patient, because I'm kind of going through this in kind of slow style there. Let's look at it from another standpoint. And I should also mention that melanin is also, the, uh, the pineal gland in particular, is involved as an anti-cancer hormone. It slows down the production of cancer, especially breast cancer. That the pineal hormone melatonin is very actively involved in the woman's menstrual cycle and that people can develop amenorrhea or a lack of a menstrual cycle because of, of uh, adaptation with the pineal. For example, when a woman goes through a long fast, she many times will become amenorrhea. When she goes through a period of stress, intense stress, her menstrual cycle can get thrown off. And that is operating through the pineal melatonin, which is a stress hormone. We also know that the pineal hormone melatonin are profoundly influenced not only by sunlight, but also by magnetic fields, especially the Earth's magnetic field. So all these things are there. There are various illnesses, if you will, that are treated. These are states of depression that are treated by what? By exposing you to sunlight at a certain time of the night. This is a condition called seasonal affective disorder. And when people become depressed from the time, usually from October through about March, during the time of low sunlight or winter, and that they become irritable and cranky and mean and sluggish, and they also develop abnormal sleep patterns, they develop cravings for sweets, you know, the sugar free, and all those kind of things, and that the treatment for it is to expose them usually to an hour or two of sunlight, of a certain kind of uh, strength, uh, during the nighttime hours to, to extend their amount of sunlight exposure. And that in itself is a treatment. And it is done so by, uh, by reducing the amount of melatonin that is present in a person's system. We find that in conditions like depression and schizophrenia, the hormone melatonin is present in lower amounts. So again, we can tie all these things in. The various medications that are used to treat anti for depression, lithium, Antidepressants antidepressants operate through pineal hormones, very important. So, so there's a long list of things. And again, I went through painful detail to review a number of those. And it is present in this paper, which is a new paper called The Eye of Peru, which is available in the back. And it, this is a review of the, of the biological medical research on the pineal gland in the past 10 or 11 years. So this is new work that has come out since I wrote the book. And so that's, this is the very newest thing. And, and it will probably be out just this one time because I will, when it goes into the new book, the new book that I'm working on called The Eye of Peru, uh, the editor usually shrinks things. So that's a struggle that 
all right to have to bear with. I'm certain I'll have to deal with it too. But let's look at it from a different perspective. In this, I'm going to use a, another paper that is also available called Comedic Images of Light, Sunlight and Moonlight. Now, I think you're going to stop and have questions. So it, gets, it won't take too much longer. Just bear with me. Africa, if you ask the question of sunlight as it impacts upon biological systems, especially because the skin is the first eye, as one author has said, the skin is the first eye. The pineal gland is the second eye. And these two eyes are the third and fourth eyes. Because in the early life forms, the first eye that came into being was the skin. It was this thing which would receive light and convert it into its various forms. In the older life forms, the, the animal forms had eyes in the front of the head and eyes in the back of the head. And the eyes in the back of the head withdrew into the brain and became a gland in the higher life forms. The lower life form, it, it remains, for example, in the western fence lizard as a eye on the top of the head. But in the, in the more advanced form, such as humans, uh, primates, uh, it became a gland, still reacting to light, still reaching hormones in relation to light and darkness. In the comedic concepts, again, this new paper that was just written, uh, of images of sunlight and, and moonlight, Africans had very particular concepts for sunlight and moonlight. When it came to sunlight, they saw light in three different aspects. They saw it in terms of the sunrise, the full noonday sun, and sunset. Sunrise was pictured as the god Kepra, K-H-E-P-E-R-A, -E -E a god which was pictured as a dung beetle rolling a ball, the sun, across the sky. Now, Kepra was used for a particular reason, because it seemed to portray the African knowledge of immortality. They knew that in the human condition, there was something in the human that didn't die, that when it had gone so far and appeared to be dead, something new would come out of it and take life all over again. And so they, would, they, they observed the dung beetle, which would roll a, a ball of animal, usually elephant or a large animal like that, pieces across, across the floor of the savanna and put it in a hole and bury its lava inside. And from this ball of dead fecal matter, here came new life, new animals bursting out and flying away. So again, the, the morning sun, something about the sun being born again was issue, was critical. The noonday sun was pictured as Horus ben Hutet, or the sun in its full radiant power. And you can read about this in the Gods of Egyptian by Wallace Budge. But it was said to have been made by the Besnet, or the so-called blacksmiths. The Horus ben Hutet is a very, very ancient title. It goes all the way to the beginnings of Egypt. It goes all the way to the beginnings of Ethiopia, which preceded Egypt. It goes all the way to the beginning of a place known as Kui Land, the place in the Mountain of the Moon regions between the western Mountain of the Moon, the Renzori Mountain range with the 12 peaks, and one central, central peak, and the eastern Mountain of the Moon, or Kilimanjaro. It goes to the beginning of the Ainu people the so-called Homo erectus type, that type which over a million years ago, these Africans later went out and populated the entire planet. So that's Horus and Hutchet, and that takes you back to taste. And when you get to that in studying the issue of the blacksmith, and not only the blacksmith see as Etku, but also asking the questions of Horus and Hutchet and the annual population of where did they originate from. And so when you come across a story, which I won't have time to get, well, I'll touch one lady here, the story of Ifa. Now, remember Ifa, for those of you who have studied the Yoruba are familiar with Ifa, I'm certain, where Ifa speaks to a certain traditional system of science, if you will, 
of the relationship to the Orishas and to the, the, the de deities of the unseen realm. But Ifa was also pictured as the first Twa person who made a mind map of the unconscious. Ifa was said to have gone, and this comes from the book, the Tignikatabu Bahale. Ifa was said to have gone inside the mouth of the moon. What does that mean? Ifa went inside of his own mind. Ifa went to the inner realm. And he was chasing a black pig, a black boy. And Ifa had these three spears. And the father was a hero hunter. He chased the boy inside the hill. And he said he took all three spears to throw them to slay this boy or this pig. And he killed him. But the pig was too big to bring out. It's too big to carry out. So Ifa went on outside and got a rope to tie around the pig and pull it out. But when he went back inside with his rope, the pig was gone. And he saw a bloody trail going further on down inside the mountain of the moon. But the fox, being fearless, went right on behind him. And he heard some noise as he went on down further. And lo and behold, he came across a woman with a white face who was a sorceress from the land of the dead. Now you have to put, listen, listen to the symbolism. This is, now this story is over a million years old. Listen to the story. And he says, and the woman tells him, are you dead? <laughs> he said, no, I'm not dead. I just came in here by chance. <laughs> I, I just went inside my inner mind by chance. I got tricked. <laughs> and, and she says, oh, why don't you come with me and spend the night with me, trying to get sweet with it? And he was repulsed by her, by her coming up like that. She wasn't an attractive white face so long. <laughs> he was turned off. You know? But next thing you knew, she got close to him and checked the mood. She got close to him and she jumped on his back <laughs> and rode him <laughs> and says, now you go to my village. Brothers, beware. <laughs> <laughs> beware. Rode him to the village and said, you're going to stay here for a while. He said, oh, I want to go home. you got to stay here a while. And then the husband of the chief came up and said, are you dead? He said, no, I'm not dead. No, he said, the question, are you dead? No, I'm not dead. He said, we well, got to stay here for a while. And so he far stayed there. He sat on a stool. The stool stuck to his behind. Uh, uh, again, the issue of the archon stool and royalty. We have to consider all those points. And so then he far began to do the dance of the gods to entertain these people. These people were so depressed. They were so gloomy and dreary. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> that they needed Ifa to entertain them. Look at the parallel of today's world. What is our role to the oppressor? Entertain them. Service. Don't think, don't challenge, just entertain. Keep us happy with your dance. Now there are many levels in which to interpret this. This is one for certain. So after about four months had passed, you have to ask four months of what kind of year? Was it a four months of a regular 362 day cycle year? Was it four months of a great year of 25,000 some odd on, on a year? If it's that kind of year, then you're talking about 6,000 years. And 6,000 would bring you from the year 4,000, the year in which the first dynasty came on that we are currently agree to, up to today. Or April, I want us to say it, April 29, 1992, Rodney King time. Or the end of the 500 year cycle from Christopher Columbus in 1492 up to 1992, in time which the Europeans were able to gain control over two continents, North America and South America, and even over our homeland. So very important questions being dealt. But I'm just saying all this, all that, <coughs> I got off the track, please, all that is tied into the noonday sun, Horus ben Hutet. Horus ben Hutet and the Horus ben Hutchet story is a warrior story. It speaks of all the ways in which Horus dealt on Seth. 
and how Horace, the kind of moves Horace had to develop to deal on set. Horace was absolutely ferocious. Oh, just sweet with it. Went all over the country cleaning up his country. So it certainly sort of has a model of how we can clean up certain tendencies in ourselves, be it jealousy between Africans, paranoia between Africans, or fear of confrontation with the lost ones. And very much the fear of confrontation with our fulfilling our own true purpose in life, whatever our spiritual mission might be. So we have the noonday sun Kemper, I mean the rising sun Kemper, noonday sun Horus and Hutter, the setting sun of Tumu. Now Tumu is another common, a very powerful concept. Tumu, the god of the setting sun, Tumu was said to be the first human to be worshipped as a god. Tumu was said to be the first man. So in other words, Tumu is the correct name for the original Adam, not Adam. That was the name we used for our own concept of Adam. It was the name Tim or Tumu. Now these various concepts of light indeed were considered in terms of the pineal gland or the eye of Peru. Let us consider one other aspect, and that has to do with the concept of the moon. A very critical thing, because when does the pineal hormone melatonin operate? During darkness. And I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that part of our enslavement, mental slavery, the oppressor knows who you truly are. He knows he can't compete. That's known. As long as they practice certain negative conditions, you can't compete. But they're hung up on practicing certain negative conditions. They love it too sweetly. It's between them and their God to come terms with that. I, can't, I, as a psychiatrist, I cannot make anybody get better who doesn't want to get better. I have no control at all. We just play games. And I have a lot of people who play games. So lots and lots. <laughs> But it's not about healing. It's about wasting time playing. Now the other point, but yet when we come to this thing about moonlight, notice the story. The god of moonlight is Tehuti, or Thoth. And Tehuti's primary companion, female companion, are the goddess Ma and the goddess Seshet. All three of these principles relate to states of mind, states of genius mind. The god Tehuti, or Thoth, was considered the perfect image of a super genius mind. Notice what that's saying. That Africans knew that inside of their own being, there was a part of them that was a god. Not a guess, but a reality. And it was a super genius quality. That meant that every African has a part of them that which we call that special black factor. You know when you're in a crisis and you gotta show enough, get down, and you step on it, and then you hit light warp speed and do something fantastic, and then if you're still in mental slavery, you say, oh, what was that? Oh, I'm so happy the Lord saved me. You saved yourself. <laughs> but you don't, you didn't give true credit to your other self. You see, the oppressor knows there's a little you and the big you. And here is a key point of the game. A key point of the game is to hypnotize Africans and to make them only believe that the little self is the only real one and to dismiss the big self as fantasy. Too good to be true. Or worse yet, Dracula or Frankenstein. Or the bad nigga. Any of those images 
or the uh, super excellent achievement, the so-called super, nothing super, that's just regular stuff. Africans called it the car factor, the soul factor. It was this thing that was freed up by living a virtuous life and studying science. So the oppressor's game is to hide images of black excellence of mental function. When a black person like Michael Jordan plays basketball and shows great skills, they say, oh, it's what? Instinct. It's, it's automatic. He didn't think it through. It's instinct. What is that trying? They're trying to hide no kind of instinct. instinct. He spent years and years of hard, diligent study and work. When it comes to a person like George Washington Carver, they do not want to talk about him at all. Why? Because George Washington Carver was the greatest living chemist on the planet in probably the past 10,000 years. But how did George Washington Carver become that? Did he go to Harvard? No, George Washington Carver led an ethical life and studied science and nature. In particular, George Washington Carver got up early in the morning while the sun was still down and went out in nature and held communion and conversation with the invisible realm. Meaning what? If you want to step on your, if you want to embrace your higher mind, you have to do it in a certain time, 24-hour day cycle. It's scientific. In other words, you catch it at a time when your melatonin level is already at its peak level, that is midnight, and then shortly before daybreak, when the other deities are out there ready to convert, to converse with you. So let's say George Washington Carver could ask questions of his mind, say, I want to know this, and plant what he has to tell me. And then he could hear the plant talk back to him and tell him the chemical formulas and secrets. He was having a conversation with nature. Because George Washington Carver, just like you and I, are children of nature. I'm not, out, I'm not out here trying to conquer nature. Why should I conquer my mother? Why should I conquer my father? They love me. And they've given me a mission here to do on earth. And if I'm true to it, I am blessed profoundly. And if I'm lazy, I get a little tight in the nut. But I'm still loved. But yet someone else doesn't see it that way. Someone else sees it as what? Oh. I only have half my melatonin key. I can't see it clearly. I'm confused. I don't even see what it is. And in my rage of confusion, I want to destroy everybody and conquer everybody. A statement of desperation. But nonetheless, Jehudi, again, during the darkness phase, was the perfect image of a super genius mind. And it said that, that there were 42 negative confessions that one had to practice, or that you did not do certain things. So when you went to the Judgment Day, and Judgment Day is not just at death. Judgment Day occurs every day. Because when we go to sleep at night, our super genius mind leaves our physical bodies, goes to the Judgment Hall, and gives a report to the ancestors. Answers to say, do you qualify for some more information? Or should you get a spank today? You want to wake up depressed? Or do you want to wake up feeling glorious? Are you willing to be adventurous and humble? Or are you going to be arrogant and foolish? So again, this, this living relationship with the invisible realm takes place every day. Not just at death. When you go to sleep, sleep is a kind of death, but so is a waking up, a rebirth. Now, very importantly, the goddess Ma'at was considered what was true, what was real. You know, in today's world, there's no such thing as reality. There is, they say that you have the uncertainty principle. You can't, you can't weigh it and measure it at the same time. That's somebody else's formulations of nature. Not ours. We said there was 
a right way and a wrong way. There was a right course for the sun to travel across the sky, and with a right way for light to enter into your eye, a right way for you to lead to your family, a right way for you to find your mission in life, a right way for you to live. And Ma represented that. And she, re she was the goddess, the chief judge in the hall of Mati, where there were 42 gods. And one had to face these 42 gods in the judgment phase when one passed into that realm on a daily basis and at the end of a psychical basis. A last point, the goddess Seshet was considered to be the goddess of, again, of the Hall of Books. So again, all of these mental factors seem, from the African point of view, to be tied to the night time phase, the phase of darkness, that phase in which a person was actually in contact with their own God potential inside the core of their own mind. And again, they were doing so with a sound eye of Peru and using powerful chemical keys to unlock the doorway to their inner mind. Now all these things I've taken some pains to go over in this second paper called The Dramatic Images of Light, which is also available. But let me just kind of bring this to a summary and to a close. We have questions and answers, uh, if you so please. And looking at black dot, a person asks, what does black dot represent? Black dot, on an esoteric level, represents the door. Its technical name is door. Door, dollar, dot, the unseen door. If you will, the 12th sephra on the so-called tree of life. And this door is a door by which energy moves from one realm to the other, from the spiritual realm, very fast-moving realm, into the dense material realm, or from the material realm, dense and, and physical, back to the spiritual realm. That Africans had defined this in a lustrous detail, in a super scientific manner in the pre-dynastic era of Kemet. Kemet goes back over 100,000 years before the dynastic age. And that the African studies of science had gone on from the time of the parents of Kemet, Ethiopia, all the way back to the parents of Ethiopia, that is the study of Nkui land, by the African Ainu people, who are the parent stock of all humanity, who were engaged in science and exploration over, a, over one million years ago. So I do not know how many science, how many civilizations rose and fell in that time, but I can say with absolute certainty that the pineal gland is a critical. Uh, now, yeah, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. No, yes, sir. I guess there's somebody I have to make an adjustment on one of these. But, but that was a, a critical point to raise, is that these, the black dot doorway to light moving from the different realms, uh, sunlight and darkness, and that, these, that the study of biology is a strong study to show the psychological, I mean the chemical basis for a, another level of expectation of the human achievement but that, in summary, that these stages of the biological aspects of humanity and psychology and spirituality are all in the library. And it is a game of propaganda, politely called propaganda, more forthrightly called lying, and trickology, hustle and pimping of information, <laughs> twisting and playing games of truth, it keeps a person in the dark. Sigmund Freud studied African studies of, of psychology. He studied Osiris, Osir, Amenta. He said that he spent more time studying history than he did psychology. Carl Gustav Jung, same story. But the trick is how to keep these people asleep or we can steal their treasures. But that day is over. 
That day is gone. Judgment Day has come. Judgment Day is here. It's 1992. 500 years have passed. That time of theft and control is past. It is the 500 year cycle of the Phoenix that will rise and fly again. It is the end of a 6,000 year period, the four months perhaps of Ephah. But it is time, my sisters and brothers, for Ephah to come back on out of the of, of Mecca, to wake on up, step on out in the light, say, oh, it's a nice little rest. <laughs> I saw some rough, I, I, had, I had some rough dreams there. <laughs> but now that I can see again, I guess I'll be getting on back home. And by the way, bring my treasure on behind me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions and answers. Uh, so those of you who wish to ask some questions, I, uh, maybe we have a mic downstairs so people can come to the mic and everyone can hear your question. Does anyone have a question or a comment? Yes, we have, if you might want to come to the mic so we can, or, or can they speak from, you know, we, have, we, have, we have a floor mic here. But maybe we can just use the mic with us, brother, so everyone can hear. Yes. Yes, so from Black Community. Yes. And Kathy. That that is true what you said. Is it true that if a person has a different type of disease or something he is in reality has a uh fighting and resistance? Yes. And the root of that fighting and resistance, does that fighting and resistance come from a bubble of self? The reason why I say that is this that the Egyptians believe that the uh the birth of of a woman inside of her stomach, of her, they call that chamber of the city of uh, the city of birth. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Within that city of birth mm -hmm. lies the very city that you see out here. Okay. Everything that you see out here is inside of her too. In, indeed. Now, being a woman as being a mother, now if, if she's being a woman of being itself, the first thing that the white man had to do was get her first. Because once he got her, he got to the city of birth. Yes. And out of that, out of that negativity that he put in there, came the negativity, negativity that we see today. Yes. So uh, the question I'm trying to raise is this, is that uh, basically all the things that's happening to us as a people is because we lack certain spiritual or certain type of hormones, certain type of secretion of the wrong negativity that brings about the change that we see today. Well, I mean, that, that's a very critical point, and I was just trying to raise a, uh, an issue that, that we really have tried to maintain our civilizations, but sometimes there are cosmic events that take place over great spans of history. Um, and one of these may have been the onset of the cyclical ice ages that have occurred periodically and, he's not, and, he's, and so the people who live in those parts of the world in which the ice age did come on for those folks who were trapped behind the glaciers, that whenever those ice ages come on, you're going to have a certain part of your population who are going to convert to light skin types and with a different kind of mentality. So that suggests that there may have been in the history of our planet many different ice ages and a repetitive cycle of the emergence of a devil from an ice age state. And that's a, that's a theoretical point because I don't have the proof for it. But you raise a very important condition, a very important uh, question that is, no matter what the condition externally, if we have the right kind of way of handling ourselves internally, we can handle that condition. So you ask me the question, well, what, can, what state of mind were my people in, our people in, that allowed this condition to progress to a point of clear vitamin deficiency. For example, why, if you were in those regions 
and you saw that you were beginning to lose people from bone conditions, then why didn't you try to find a solution for that? I mean, were these people, for example, who, were, for other reasons, weren't able to find a, a solution? Was there conflict between Africans of some sort that promoted that kind of condition? And that I, that I, I, I just don't know. Um, but there is, again, for most mental states, you know, one can ask, what, what, what comes first? Uh, is it the physical thought or is it the idea? And I just can't say which comes first, but I know that thoughts do shape the physical body. And this is one example where, where the, not only does the, uh, where the physical body, where the thoughts were being shaped in reverse by the physical body, by a deficiency and a calcification of the pineal, then one could not embrace the higher thoughts that one would have to embrace to be able to hold up that genius level of mind. And they begin to operate on a more material level, a more dense level, and begin to come across as paranoid, aggressive, and hungry. Right. Uh, so, uh, every communication is a vibration of sound. Mm -hmm. Vibration of sound and that vibration is a pure temperament. Mm -hmm. Because for 13 months, they didn't expect that vibration of sound. They heard it, but they didn't expect it because the verdict was not good. Now, the reality is that if you see your film, what we see was the truth. So, for sure, people don't expect their vibration, mm -hmm. nor their sound, nor they don't expect their reality. Indeed. Because we represent the reality of the stuff, we represent the highest in the vibration and the sound. Indeed. When you, when you talk about sex, you say uh, uh, the color red. Mm -hmm. The red represents the color of passion. Mm -hmm. And passion is the lowest vibration of the truth. Red is the lowest vibration of the color in the universe. Mm -hmm. Which represents the devil itself. Mm -hmm. The dog is a symbol of passion, which represents his God. Mm -hmm. So, in reality, when you deal with the red, you deal with the red, the red car. Mm -hmm. So, you deal with the love, you have to deal with the high. The number three itself is the number of reality. Mm -hmm. The three represents 12, it represents 12 high, it represents the fullness of something. Mm -hmm. So, when you deal with the third eye, you are dealing with the eye of reality. Mm -hmm. That's right. Very good. Thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Very good, thank you. Uh, given uh, the differences in the physiology of African people as opposed to Europeans and with the known content, and it feels like how, how should a person practice the impact of how that information in terms of the type of psychotropic medication that are prescribed mm -hmm. illnesses like schizophrenia, mm -hmm. illness like uh, reactive stress, those Sure, things. sure, sure. And let, me, let me speak of the current day practice and what some prospect of the future might be. Uh, current day practice, of course, and, uh, I'm going to speak in the detail kind of which I, I gather that you are a practitioner of sorts. And in the current day practice uh, of psychiatry, psychiatry is heavily impacted upon by the financial resources of the patient and that there is a multi-tiered system. There is minimal care and there's best care. So I'm going to those kind of dimensions. And that is, and, 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 and unless the person is a truly motivated practitioner and often a starving practitioner, <laughs> that a person usually, uh, the way it is done, that a person who sees a person who has minimal resources is given minimal treatment. They are most often misdiagnosed and most often mismedicated and mismanaged. And examples of that, a person comes in, uh, not too much family history is taken, they're reported to be psychotic, hearing voices, hallucinating, and delusions. Uh, not too, they might have a, a toxicology panel done to see if they're on any kind of particular medication. Uh, usually no other family members are contacted, and usually because the family members are talking to non-black people or non-sensitive black people, they aren't too willing to volunteer history. And so there's usually there's no family history of two or three generations back that will show how these conditions arose. Uh, the diagnosis that is used most often is not that of depression, it's that of psychosis or character disorder. And the person is usually parked on a high dosage of medication, antipsychotic, and they're usually left on this high dose of medication for long periods of time. Uh, off in the compliance rate of the patient taking the medications or a business <laughs> under those conditions. 
And so at first, we usually had repeated episodes of dysfunction as they go off their medications prematurely, and, go, and then they're forced to go back on, usually by court order, usually, and if you're male, or, depending if you're male or female. If you're male, quite often your behaviors are defined as being aggressive and dangerous, and you end up in the penal situation right quick. And so that your, your care and in the penal institution, and this is my experience, the, uh, quite often in the penal institutions, people receive minimal care or no care, not even medications while in jail, often thrust in the general population, and used or abused, taken advantage of in the general population, or left to be grossly psychotic so that it would be e easily misused when they go through the court process. And I've seen all of that, I've been a part of it as a practitioner all the way through. And that I know from my own personal experience. Uh, in a more ideal state, and so I'm saying it's not, that, it's not that mental health needs to be that ugly. It's not. It can be a lot more elegant than that. I've seen black practitioners, many other practitioners who truly were committed to their patient. They shine like a diamond ring. I mean, they dealt with their patient. They knew them on a personal basis. The patient would confide in them, tell them their detailed history. And many times, it's, sir, this person has some kind of strange condition in which they would just have these sometimes effective illness states with, with the, uh, another kind of medication, sometimes lithium, which has some other risks down the road that they can sometimes be maintained on small doses, not no 20 milligrams of Haldol or 30, 40 of prolixin, sometimes just one or two milligrams of prolixin. And when they're in crisis, they would be seen to talk it out, not medicate it out, you know, talk the stuff out and sort through the conflicts. And by that process, I have patients right now that I can tell, right when they get ready to go into their psychotic phase, their sleep patterns unravel first. And so when they start stop sleeping, I say, oh, what's happening, Ms. Jones? Oh, nothing's going on. That means let's talk about it, Ms. Jones, because you many times are not aware of when things are really troubling you. And I take a detailed history and say, oh, this is, and let's get your dreams. The dream content will many times show what the nature of the conflict might be. And I also talk to other family members. Oh, yeah, that's mama doing her thing again. That's dad doing his thing again. So we get this kind of history and catch it in the butt before it becomes full blown. And also the medication levels are usually are reduced. But many times a person, if they need to be on medication, they may not have to stay on it until they can resolve. Sometimes medication can be a lifelong thing or many years, but it must be a dose that it does not remain the same dose. It has to be titrated up and down, dependent upon need. But again, the third party payers many times put a cap on how many times a patient can come see the therapist. <laughs> so they can't even see the frequent monitoring. And if therapist has to bite the bullet, <laughs> then that old story, you know, and deal. Um, but let's look to the future. What, other, what else is on the horizon way of treatment? What is on the horizon way of treatment is using light itself to treat affective illness states and depressional states and psychotic states and using portable handheld magnetic field generators to treat certain affective illness states, postpartum depression, and certain psychotic conditions. And using mineral replacements, particular um, uh, vitamin E as a mineral replacement in the treatment of certain what we call uh, high oxidant or, or high free radical content type psychotic states. So those are some of the things that are right around the corner that will probably be employed more so be of course, the light treatment of depression is currently in use even at present. So those are some, I, I, are you a practitioner, my brother? No, I'm a professional. Yes, a practitioner, <laughs> involved in the same struggle. So it's, you know, these, are, these are the kind of struggles we go through, but, but I should say this, what I've usually found <coughs> is that it is critical to get a life history of the patient, usually from other family members as well, because you, they're carrying the same issues generation from generation to generation. The same stuff over and might be a little bit surface dressing how it is managed. Same issues being passed through multi-generations. Multi-generations. Other questions, sisters and brothers? Yes. Sleep pattern, a 
first sleep pattern, tend, sleep needs tend to decrease with age. As you get older, the melatonin level automatically decreases with time in the uninitiated. In the initiated, I think it's just the reverse, the increase, uh, because of some very profound things involving a thing called the soul ray moving through the central canal and energizing the chakras or the different granules that are that along the spine. But back to the point, the point is, is that uh, uh, the, the sleep patterns, I would encourage a person to try to wake up around 4 a.m. and get, I mean, some people need six, eight, some people need five, four. Um, and usually trying to wake up around four so you can get that hour or hour and a half right with daybreak. That's such a profound time. Usually the, the uh, and again, I think each person has to evaluate themselves. Some of us are morning people, some of us are nighttime people. And to ask a, a night owl to get up that time of morning would not be not the way to go because they just move like concrete in the morning. Whereas a morning person moves like concrete at 10, 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> so you have to see when is your phase of activity the greatest and, and more, when is your mind the most fluid. But for the morning person, that, that morning time of getting up at 4 is critical. And uh, it's a time in which a person has a very fluid flow of, of thoughts and creative ideas. Yes. What relationship does melanin have with DNA? Is melanin more defined as a prime relative than the DNA? A very important question. And all questions are important. Uh, what relationship does melanin have with DNA? DNA is, again, the genetic blueprint by that, that orders cells how to do their thing. And melanin has been indeed found in the DNA of mitochondria. DNA is present in the nucleus of the cell. It's also present in mitochondria in the cell cytoplasm. And it is thought by some that in the early forms of living systems that melanin was present even before there was DNA. DNA is a, is a later development. Uh, nonetheless, that we can look upon the cell, we have a chemical approach to life, a chemical theory of life, you can also look upon it in, in terms of an energetic approach to life, that is looking at the movement of energy from one system to the next in discrete quantum. Using that approach, melanin is a very powerful electron sink. It soaks up energy, and it can release energy in very discrete amounts. And it, it, it is in this discrete release that you have informational value, just like you have a, a, a computer chip storing energy in discrete amounts, releasing discrete amounts. So that melanin is, is indeed seen to have a very active relationship with DNA by being able to, in some way, modulate how much energy can be released into the DNA, at least in the mitochondria. And then they may play a similar role in terms of the nucleus. Um, should also mention that in the mitochondria, in the pineal gland, the mitochondria and the pineal gland are unique. They take up calcium in a mountain, and the mitochondria is the energy storehouse. So it's like a battery inside of the cell. It takes up calcium and uses calcium as a fuel. It doesn't even use ATP, the common gas of the cell, the common fuel of it. it uses calcium as a fuel producing agent. And that's unique. I don't even know what that's all about. Uh, so, Max, I guess in, in summary to your question, that the DNA. Is, a, is thought by some to be a later development and that the earlier system that was able to capture sunlight, hold on to sunlight and generate other chemical species was probably melanin itself in the early system. Now, it, as to how melanin got there, some believe that melanin, which again, carbon, the key element that makes up melanin is formed in the core of a star in the course of its stellar lifetime that as the, uh, the nuclei of that make up the atoms that make up the, the fuel from the sun are, are compacted upon each other, more co uh, complex atoms are, are, are formed, and it reaches a phase in which the outer phase is blown off. And so this carbon core is thrown into space as, as carbon molecules, or individual carbon atoms, and then coalesce in the gas clouds 
unicellular gas clouds that form complex carbon-containing molecules, which later, by cometary movement, are then filtered now to form these planetary surfaces or impacts from meteorites or craters. So there's a theory of the impregnation, of the ongoing impregnation of the surface of a planet by carbonation material that had an interstellar gas cloud origin. So all that I think is tied into your question. So it raises a lot of, a lot of other questions as well. Yes, Brother Rob. Very, very important. The, uh, uh, there are many conditions that can certainly decrease uh, pineal gland function. Uh, many of the tranquilizers, for example, uh, do so by decreasing the duration of the melatonin release and the and the amount of melatonin release. So that your tranquilizers, uh, your Valium, Xanax will do that. Alcohol will do that. Um, questions about high carbohydrate diets or frequent feedings of a lot of starches, for example, may also play a role with that. Uh, in terms of those conditions that will increase melatonin production, fasting would probably tend to increase it. Uh, exercise will also, exercise will also, to a degree, will also, will also promote melatonin release to a degree. Uh, so a person can, quote, run and get that runner's high and be immune to the pain of the run, of the lactic acid build up. Uh, the most, a, a very important way, in terms of a very living organic way, is finding out what your life's mission is. That line of work, and when you pursue it, you feel yourself becoming light. That's a play of foreign words, L-I-G-H-T, energy, but light also in the sense of feeling very uplifting. Those things that make your toes tingle, so to speak, that make your spine tingle, that make you feel super alert, crystal clear, smelling fragrant smells in the air, <laughs> that love kind of feeling, that those are very important feelings because there are ideas that initiate or activate the release of opiates. These are endogenous, naturally occurring hormones or peptides inside the brain that are 200 times more potent than morphine. So the quality and also the opiates act in concert in a yin-yang fashion with melatonin. So the, the quality of your thoughts, and, and by this sense, quality relates to your pursuing a line of creative work that is the thing that you were put here to do. It's, it's, it's your thing. The thing that you do, not well, but brilliantly, without much effort. And then as you get into it, you have to do a lot more effort because that's your call, and you're supposed to raise it to a high level of, of perfection. So it, again, also, that's those same kind of high tone feeling thoughts occur in the quality of the interaction between a man and a woman. We know that. Between a parent and a child. And between fellow Africans in their communities. In other words, there's the pursuing of one's own mission, but also the maintenance of one's own family. And that the, and also said that the woman is a mirror of a man's soul, and the man is a mirror of the woman's soul. A woman can tell the man about his hidden other side and what he needs to tighten up on, and the same fashion that a man can tell a woman about her stuff. The question is, do it gently. <laughs> but you didn't listen to me. Do it gently, I'm told. 
and at the right time. <laughs> but th this notion of the of, of thoughts, the thoughts actually change the physical body because as you pursue these thoughts and move on to progressive higher thoughts, the pineal gland will increase its hormonal amount of release. The other glands get control, the, 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 the so-called growth hormone that controls bone structure, fat distribution, that also changes. So the quality of one's thoughts changes the shape and appearance of the physical body. That, that was also known. Uh, sound, food, magnetic fields. Uh, but the one that I've seen, again, the one that I've seen really, really work are the quality of the thoughts. Food. Food is not only light, light is a kind of food, air is a kind of food. Relationships, a most relationship is a heavy food. <laughs> Romance, uh, sharp dialogue, whatever that means. <laughs> All these things are foods. Words are foods, ideas are foods. We need to look at it in a much more expanded kind of way. But that's, those are, those are major. And the key theme is that as you, as you unfold the glands, these various glands will increase their hormonal output. So the hormonal output that we talk about in most parts is that of a neophyte, a person who's not practicing any of these higher science ideas of ethics and study of nature. But as you pursue those, the amount of methylene release increases profoundly. Yes, uh, anyone else? Thank you very much. Yes. I'd like to uh, ask a two-part question. Yes. Um, there has been a conference, and it's been an annual conference, mm -hmm. where uh, a number of scholars have come together to uh, discuss the recent findings on uh, Melanie. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget the actual name of the conference, but it's just an annual conference mm -hmm. on Melanie. Is that still happening? That's the first part of the question. Well, I, I'm, the president, I'm the president of that group, so I, I should know. <laughs> the name, name of the group is the Kimware Science Consortium, and they have met every year, including this year. Uh, and the last year, in 91, they met in Los Angeles. And they usually meet in the, sometime in April. And this year, because of low finances, and I will also, if we didn't manage the group correctly, I take responsibility for the management of it. And I also the mismanagement of it. Uh, the group met in a mini con a small conference in Memphis, Tennessee. So, and they will hold another national conference again in April of next year, 93, yet to be defined as location. But until then, they're having several mini conferences, which are like two-day conferences, in which a local group will host the, uh, the, the national uh, group to come and, and give its presentations. And so that the next mini conference will be next Friday and Saturday and Sunday in Oakland, California. And then the one after that will be, I think, the week, the last weekend in September in Baltimore, Maryland. And there may be one after that. I'm not certain as to where. And then there will be a big one again in April of 93. So how will we get information on that? Well, I'll certainly make it available to such as the brothers who are hosting this affair here. Um, I'll try to make that available. And uh, the address, uh, I'll, I can give you a, a general address at, at the end of this that you can write to in terms of Oakland uh, if you want to have direct contact. Or you can also, I'll give you my address as well if you want to stay in direct contact. And the second part of the question is, uh, could you give us a, a brief synopsis of the state of the melanin and other conferences mm -hmm. is always about more Mm -hmm. Yes. Now the highlights, I guess in terms of the, there are different specialists. I, I specialize more on the pineal side. Uh, the person who worked a lot with the melanin side has was the, is Carol Barnes. Um, and Carol Barnes continues to work very, in a very strong way with that. And he, at this time, he's looking into the question of, of the binding of melanin to naturally occurring melanin, I mean the binding of drugs to melanin. And so he kind of advises against the taking of a lot of the drugs that I as a physician might use for fear that they might bind very strongly with melanin and be and be and remain tightly bound over a long period of time. Uh, 
So that's that's one of the, and he, he continues to kind of spell that question out. Um, in terms of the pineal gland, there has been an explosion of new knowledge. I mean, that stuff is, I mean, I, the general field is like just multiplying year by year by year. So for example, in 92, we're talking about magnetic fields in the pineal gland, and that you can treat certain kinds of seizures, uh, which are called seasonal seizures, by exposing the person to a magnetic field, a handheld magnetic field. And people are having four to six uh, full tonic clock seizures a day going down to zero. <laughs> and so you can treat that with a handheld magnetic field generator, putting over the head, particular part of the, uh, where, the, where, the, where the seizure focus originates, um, and, ha and very, having very good results. Uh, the treatment of the treatment of certain kinds of depression with light, looking upon seasonal affective disorder and seasonal panic attacks as alterations in the pineal yeast and melatonin that you can then further modify by changing the time that a person is exposed to, some, to, to a light source. Uh, now, mind you, none of those folks have talked about what's the relationship between skin color and the level of pineal gland function. But I hope to have a paper submitted this in the next two months that will address that. And the, also the issue of pineal calcification. So in 1992, both of those letters should be, both of those should be in print in some journal or somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I know. Yes, sir. Uh, a coworker of mine, he was an academic doctor in Texas. Yes. And had a severe. And that, 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 that's a very critical one. It's been shown that the pioneer hormone melatonin does affect very important parts of the, of the autoimmune system, in, in particular the, some of the T cells. So when a person is, so the, a person, melatonin level, for example, when a person gets depressed, he might have been depressed about being shot and being mobilized, I don't, I don't know what the conditions were around me, being, being immobilized, loss of income, the pain, chronic pain, and maybe the condition in which, which this accident occurred may have been very depressing for him, may have mobilized a lot of fear and rage, or a lot of, you know, a lot of sense of being overwhelmed. And he may have experienced a depression that would result in a lowering of his melatonin levels. And when the melatonin levels were, were lowered, then the cells that helped mediate his autoimmune system became disarrayed, no longer, and he began, and the cells rather than attacking against uh, outside later cell types now began to misread his own body and attack his own body and attack the melanocytes in his skin and lead to albinism. And that is, and that, that certainly does occur it's, as a stress reaction. Is, is that the same Well, usually there's cell, I mean, I, I'm not up on that particular condition, but usually there's cell death. Usually, usually there's death of the melanocyte. Uh, what he may want to consider is uh, there's a person named Sank, S-A-N-D-Y-K, at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in, in New York City, who would be quite familiar with these, these concepts. So he may want to consider this going, that's not too far from here, and going to New York City, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and talking to Ruth and Sank, or having to just consult with them in terms of the role of melatonin and the autoimmune system. Uh, and, but more importantly, that's our responsibility so that maybe if I come for you in a year or two from now, I say, oh yes, I know what to do as your own physician. And that, that's why you come here to see me, to encourage me to continue on and also learn from me and make others you know, see the relevance of this kind of work and find how it works in your own life. Uh, he may also want to increase the melatonin release. He could increase his melatonin release by, by eating, taking large amounts of tryptophan that's the present in bananas, for example. Uh, he may want to increase the amount of melatonin release. Uh, now, I should have mentioned this. Does his, do his problems get worse during the winter months? 
or they just been just they, they, there's no seasonal pattern to it. I can say he, he may want to he may want he may want to look and see as the the rate at which his his problem has come. He said it's almost complete now. It's almost almost his entire body now. So those, those are things. A, a pigmentation left in the is there? Pardon? And 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 and, 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 and and they're in, so, so that's only part of it. Yeah, he's probably lost most of it by now. Whether it's late or dead, I don't know. Whether the melanocyte is late, I mean, just inactive or dead, that, that, I, that I just can't say. Okay, thank you. Thank you, brother. And also, too, with the pigmentation, it's like the pigment of the You know, I, I think there are people who do have other practices that are can be of value in terms of certain kind of eye, eye practices. You, you mentioned the Tibetan eye practices in terms of eye exercises that are said to strengthen the pineal. And the, we also mentioned the comedic practices, that the quality of one's life in terms of the ethical practices and the studies of science and nature were another very profound kind of practice that had a very sustaining nature to it. Uh, there's, a, there's probably a natural desire to find the most, the quickest, shortest route. Uh, and that probably has short-term value. Uh, the other one is more of a kind of a long-term, life-term kind of approach. Um, again, the, the, many of these East Indian or, or Asiatic styles do have tremendous links with the ancient Kemetic parent sources. Hearing that they went Kemet, that prior to the fall of Kemet, according to George Jean and James Sloan Lake, there was a worldwide university system throughout the world with branches on all the major continents and headquarters in Egypt. And that when the old world fell, then these various places became out of contact with each other. And many of the initiate scientists, as they left Kemet, as it was being overrun, went south, went west, and went east into these various places to, as their place of sanctuary to continue their work and to continue their studies. So, so there was a, that, that kind of history to it. So there's, a lot of them do have some of the same traditions. The reason why I asked the question is I was wondering if I, you make reference to the Kemetic system, but I was wondering if there are any things that point to specifically that the help a person who is looking for an institution form some um, things that they can get involved in, in a real way. Okay. Um, that, that, that point in the direction. I know that, um, I know, for example, there were classes in, I guess, in the LA area to prepare the spirit of some yes. places like that. Are there, are there other places perhaps that one can go to and, and get involved in a, in a specific way? Something that can lead further in that direction. That's totally cool. Yeah. Sure, I mean, I think it's important to have support groups around you to kind of share information and keep certain disciplines active. And uh, the, you mentioned the Aquarius Spiritual Center who has a black knock studies and they have a mail order system that, that's kind of, can be obtained in any place in the country, just by mail. Uh, and there are other, other groups. I mean, there is certainly, there is ASCAC, for example, that has active studies in which you've now formed in this area, in which you have a, a access to a, a international group of, of African scholars, sisters and brothers, who, had, who can show you the library, really, in terms of what books to have access to to promote certain studies. Uh, so that one could go into the, 20, the, neg the 42 negative confessions, the 42 assessors, and study these things in detail. Uh,